Loved ones, this video is session for management 3130. It is session 11. If we were meeting face to face, darn it, I wish we were. This would be 6 July, 2020. Um, I have one admin thing to share with you, and that is our next class, session 12 on the syllabus. Our next class is, is midterm two. Um, the scope is chapters five through eight, uh, short essay questions, and it will be due on 8 July. I'll post it on 7 July, and I will take it down at the close of business on 8 July. And you have until midnight that night to get it to me. So, today is a conversation about chapter eight. Uh, in the textbook, it's about organizational design, culture, structure, um, a lot of useful stuff. Before I begin, I need to share a story with you. A number of years ago, I, I was uh, in my truck with a friend. My friend's first name is Harris. And um, Harris was looking for a heavyweight pickup truck. He had, he had an older one. I think it was beyond its service life. And he had just bought a new boat. When I say new boat, to me, this was a very big boat. In fact, it was probably 32, 34 feet long. It was the max size that is trailerable. Beyond that, you can't trailer it. It's against DOT regulations. So he was looking for a new tow vehicle. His boat was gorgeous. This was like a, a center console boat that you would use for blue water fishing. Uh, I don't, again, I don't remember the length, length precisely, but he had three big outboards on the transom. I mean, this was, uh, this thing was a meat eater. Um, so, Harris was actively looking for a turbo diesel pickup truck built on a one-ton chassis as a tow vehicle, because that would have been a very, very competent tow vehicle. So, riding around together, we weren't, we weren't actively searching for trucks, we were actually shooting. I think it was a sporting clay stick. And uh, we drove past a dealership, and, and on the point, every dealership has a one or, or sometimes two uh, parking spaces on their lot that, that they call the point. And I want you to visualize this. The point would be where, where the corner of the dealership sits on a, on a visible street. Uh, let's say this is Main Street and this is the corner of the dealership lot. Well, that would be the point. And inevitably, they always put vehicles that draw people in. Uh, if I owned the Ford store here in Statesboro, I promise you there'd be a high quality pickup truck or a Shelby GT350 on the point. If I had a Jeep store, I'd have a fancy Rubicon there. The, the vehicles put at the point are always meant to draw people in because they, they, they pump. So Harris and I are driving by this, this uh, dealership and there's a Ford Super Duty on the point. He said, Bill, turn around, go back, let's look at that. So we go back and park in the lot and, and, and um, as we walk up to it, we see that there's a badge on the front fender that says V10 and his heart just dropped. The V10 is a fine gasoline engine, but it doesn't have sufficient torque to tow heavy boats, and it probably only gets eight or nine miles a gallon, best case scenario. If you drop one out of a C-130 at 25,000 feet, it would only get eight or nine miles a gallon. So, as we approached the truck, we saw the badge and realized that it wasn't a turbo diesel, but that's okay. However, does it surprise you to hear that a salesman pounced on us and said, Boy, that damn truck would look good on you. And uh, Harris said, I don't think I'm interested. And he said, that there's the economy model. And, and I could just see Harris sort of mentally scratching his head, thinking, he, he even said to the guy, he said, that only gets about eight or nine miles a gallon. And, and the sales guy said, hell yeah. Every time you start that some bitch, it's good for the economy. Well, Harris didn't buy the truck but I, I wanted to share that story with you. So, now we're in chapter eight. I'm on 283 in the textbook, and uh, there's, a, there's a very competent definition of organizational culture presented there. Um, it, it is much more elaborate than most definitions of org culture because it talks about every piece of the puzzle. Belief, symbols, values, that sort of stuff. So 
Here's what I want to do. I want to simplify that definition. And, and I promise you, what I'm about to share with you would, is very durable. It would work well in your lives for a long time. Though there are competing definitions, a classic definition of an organization's culture would be the shared values of its members. And uh, I would be quick to admit that some cultures have very negative values and some cultures have very positive values. And I get that because some values are virtuous and other values aren't. But it's not difficult, I don't think, to discern an organization's culture just in visiting its facility. You sort of get the sense that, it, that it's high energy, people are engaged, or they want to duck and hide and have nothing to do with you, or there are, there are visibly high levels of stress. So the point is that, that I get it, that it's intangible, I understand that. So my definition, though it is simple and, and fairly workable, my definition of shared values is incomplete. And, and, and there are so many ways you can challenge it. The first thing that's true is you, any one of you, could join an organization and not adopt its values. You could show up for work, do a competent job, and, and all you care about is five o'clock or Friday or payday. You don't have to, you don't have to let the organization's values become inculcated. They don't have to become part, you don't internalize them. They don't become part of your values. A second thing that you'll discover is some organizations have a dysfunctional culture. Um, the, the funny thing is, everybody shares the same values, but they're dead wrong. Here's an example, it's happened a hundred times in business in America. A company will, at a moment in time, be first or second in its industry. So there'll be some emerging tech and the people in the company will poo-poo it. They'll say, we're number one. We don't need these people telling us what to do. Well, guess what, loved ones? The market is not constrained to what those people believe. So if somebody brings something to the market that has better features, lower costs, whatever the case may be, the market may accept it. And if that's true, they may leave the used to be number one company in the dust. There are so many companies that have actually become complacent. They're resistant to change because they think that their past successes are gonna somehow carry them, and that is not a reality. Look at professional football. A team can be in the Super Bowl one year and have a one in 16 record the next. Look at Southern. The first, uh, the first season that Chad Lunsford was our head coach, he took over mid-season and he took over a program that was deeply damaged by the prior coaching staff. And I think we went two and 10 that year. The next season, we went 10 and three and won a bowl game. So the, the thing about past situations don't predict the future very well, it, it's everywhere, it's not just in sports. But, but when I say to you a dysfunctional culture, if a, if a company is resistant to change, if they think they're all that in a bag of Doritos, because they've been profitable for a few years, that doesn't predict the future. So that is a classic example of a dysfunctional culture, one that is resistant to change. And they're also, I want you to understand that in any, any organization of size, I mean, if you're talking about a family or a restaurant, you're not gonna run into what I'm gonna discuss now, but in any organization that's got size, a lot of critical mass, there are often competing subcultures. Like, let's assume that you manufacture something. I don't care what it is. Bottled water, or you make bulldozers, or, or men's shirts, it doesn't matter. Um, I can promise you that the people in production want to set up a machinery to produce the same product with no variation. They want to put feedstock in it and carefully watch quality control. Production wants long, uninterrupted runs of the same stuff. The marketing people don't live in that corner of the world. They're gonna be out banging on doors and they're gonna promise their customers anything. Overnight delivery, fuchsia for color or vermilion or things that I can't even spell. Uh, we'll give you, you know, cheap price, we'll pay the freight. Marketing wants customization and overnight delivery. Production wants sort of homogeneity. They wanna do the same thing for long periods of time because that's how they get consistency, quality, of product cost low, 
So in almost any organization that manufactures, there's going to be this tension between production and marketing. They have different objectives. They shouldn't. Everyone should be literally focused on the same goals. But, but that oftentimes in organizations, subcultures. Um, there are seven colleges at Georgia Southern. Do you think that we compete for resources with the other ones? Heck yes. Heck yes. What if the president or the provost said, we've got a couple of million dollars for new faculty lines. You think the seven deans would say, I'll just take one seventh. No! Every one of them wants the entire sum of money. And every one of them will make an argument. So my point is there is competition. So, so in many organizations of size, you'll find that there are competing subcultures, union versus management, um, all sorts of examples of that. Now, still in this conversation of culture, um, the authors talk about three levels of culture, and I think this is a, an informative view. First thing they say is some, one level of culture will be observable. It will be dress, it will be ceremonies, it will be behavior. For many, many years, IBM, the big uh, international business machines company, required all of its salesmen to wear navy blue suits, white shirts, that was it, no option. You had options for ties and shoes, that was it. Navy blue suits, dark blue suits, white shirts, that was it, that was required. Um, how many places have you been where there is a uniform? I think most Target stores wear what I would call a red polo with, with khaki slacks, um, many, many places. You can look at dress, you can look at ceremonies, you can look at behaviors. Um, so one of the things that the authors talk about is they talk about these observable artifacts of a culture. The next thing they talk about are the espoused values. Most organizations have both a mission and a vision statement. Now, those are declared values. They aren't necessarily the values that are enacted. And, and the reason I want to make that distinction is really twofold. The first is we're not going to talk about the core values in a minute. But most mission statements and most vision statements are very, very abstract. They're very high level. And, and the truth is most of them are just loaded with platitudes. A platitude is an empty promise. We aspire to be world-class providers of exceeding the expect expectations of our customer group, all the while being socially responsible, loving our employees, and petting harp seal pumps. Most mission and vision statements are goofy because they're unachievable. They're abstract, they're very, very high level, they're not concrete, they're not measurable, and, and they're full of platitudes, empty promises. Now, the reason that that's a legitimate distinction is that's a discussion of a spouse values, mission and vision statement. That's what a company declares. Now, the third thing that the authors talk about is they talk about core values. Those are the actual values of the organizations, the behaviors that we observe. Um, and oftentimes core values are emergent, especially if a firm's at a growth stage. I want you to think about this. Steve Jobs said this happened at Apple, it happens everywhere. Uh, a founder, someone with an entrepreneurial fire in her or his belly, will, will want to bring a concept to market and, and they'll wrap a venture team around it, they'll marshal resources, develop strategies and launch, and that's all wonderful. So at the early stages of any business, the founding team has a huge imprint. But if the firm is successful, if it gains traction in the market, if, if the market accepts it and buys a lot of its stuff, at some early point in that growth curve, it's going to have to bring in professional manage, managers. It's going to have to um, uh, uh, sort of devolve into specialization. Here's production, here's accounting, here's finance, here's marketing, here's engineering. And, and professional managers are going to be running those groups and they're not going to have the same passion, the same commitment, the same vision as the founding team did. So the point is that when we talk about core values, those are the things that, that are actual, that, that are in play, that we see, um, rather than the articulated values when we say, oh, we're gonna be wonderful and y'all are gonna love us. So big difference between those two things, what is espoused and, and what, is, uh, what is visible. 
Now, we're going to step away from culture. We're going to talk about organizational structure. And, and uh, the authors use a, a sort of a, a framework. They use a typography that I haven't seen often, but I think it's a very workable one. They say that there are four types of structure, and they start with structural type that they describe as a clan. Okay, a clan would be a big, loose, fuzzy, furry family. I would say to you that Harley Davidson voters are a clan. There are about five or six million up in the United States. They all wave and say, hey, and try to look like each other. And uh, um, they, they just love getting together and riding, you know, hog. Hog means Harley owners group and their chapters all over the United States, indeed, all over the world. But my point is, there are some organizations that have this, this loose, fuzzy, warm, tribal kind of a thing, and that's what the authors are describing as a clan. I would argue that that's a place where the founding team has created a culture that's durable, that, that outlives them. And I think that's pretty remarkable when it happens. I can promise you for decades that describes Southwest Airlines. Uh, Herb Kelleher was, was the founder and CEO in 19, probably 67-ish. And, and he associated people with him who shared the same values. And, and for 25, 30 years, the company was remarkably consistent in, in, its, in its organizational behaviors. So a clan is one type of structure. A uh, great deal of warm flexibility, uh, adaptability. Then they talk about an adhocracy. It's a word that I think is, is not in common use. And, and they're suggesting that an adhocracy is a form of organization that adapts and creates and innovates. That's the Marine Corps, isn't it? Isn't that what they say? Adapt, improvise, overcome. But the significance of that is a lot of firms don't innovate, a lot of firms don't adapt. So that's got to be a legitimate type of firm. Would you like to be in a firm that, that reads the environment and adapts and develops novel solutions? I think that might be a pretty neat place for me. Um, Market-based firm, external focus. Okay, that would describe PepsiCo. PepsiCo is, a, is an organization, although it has manufacturing facilities all over the world, PepsiCo is an organization that is driven by sales, driven by market share. The company obsesses about that. People are rewarded and praised when they meet or exceed targets and they're released when they don't. So PepsiCo is an example of a market-driven company. And in recent years, ever since it divested itself of, of the fast food chains that it owned, Pepsi for, oh gosh, 25 years maybe, owned KFC, uh, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. And, and about 20 years ago, Pepsi divested, divested of those three chains. And they created a company called Tricon, I think. And within a year or two, Tricon became cleverly known as Yum Brands. Not they didn't pay anybody for that. So Yum Brands now has got 35 or 40,000 units worldwide. So Pepsi, when it did that, Pepsi said, our intentions are to do precisely two things. We're gonna be in the beverage market, not on the beverage market, and we're gonna sell snacks because Texio, uh, Pepsi owns Frito-Lays, Lance, Tom's Foods, a bunch of snack stuff. So that's where Pepsi, that's where it has its, its presence non-alcohol beverages and, and uh, snack foods. So my point is that Pepsi is very much a market-driven company. And, and it's not, that's not a criticism, but it is a reality. And then the last thing they talk about is a hierarchy. And, and, and I, I'm, I struggle with that because almost all, all organizations are hierarchy. By that I mean there are different levels of the organization and decision-making authority resides with different people at different levels. Um, if I work for J.C. Lewis in the service department, let's assume I'm the service manager, I am certain I have the authority to order shop supplies. I'm not sure that I have the authority to uh, uh, order new machines. Like, for example, I understand that the alignment machines, by virtue of lasers and a variety of other things that are, that are sold in the market today, are about 100 grand. It's improbable that I could order an expensive machine without approval from somebody at another level in so I'm not so sure that that's a type because almost every organization has levels of responsibility. 
where decision-making authority rests. But here's a legitimate question. In fact, this is one of those little shady boxes on page 289. Where do you think you would fit? What type of organization do you think would satisfy you? And, and I'll talk about, well, let me jump to it right now. Let me jump to 292 because there's a discussion there about the significance of fit. And that discussion is, is a primer. Um, what sort of an organization would I fit in? Um, I'm not sure that I have a clever answer for that. I would have to be one that, in my view, was not resource poor. It would have to be one where integrity was just a, a, a theme that resonates. People are going to take shortcuts, lie, cheat, steal, manipulate. I'll just shoot them all and go to jail. Um, so it, it, it could not, doesn't have to be resource rich, but it can't be deprived of resources. I would only associate myself with a firm if I were convinced that integrity was, was a core value that was adopted by everybody there. I mean that. I'm not patronizing, I'm not sermonizing. Uh, I have no interest in sharing a jail cell with any co workers. Um, I love the notion that a firm would adapt and innovate. And where am I? I'm a state employee. <laughs> oh dear. But the truth is, fit influenced my decision to join this faculty. Uh, part of it is that I never lived in coastal Georgia until I accepted the position at Southern. But I've lived in Georgia for big parts of my life. Um, like. 30 years out of the first 50 years of my life, I lived in Georgia. Uh, my wife was born in Georgia. We met married in Atlanta. Uh, and, and we left because I went to grad school and took a position first at IU. Go Hosers. And then I spent a little time at Louisville. But uh, coming here, for me, was very much a quality of life decision. And it was a quality of life decision because of the place. Because I live in coastal Georgia. I work, I work 45 miles from a destination resort and 50 miles from the beach. I can be in my hunt club in 15 minutes and a rifle range in 20. We live on six acres. I love it. Uh, just from a quality of life perspective, for me, this place is extraordinary. Uh, the other thing that's true is Georgia Southern, in terms of its expectations of faculty, has what we faculty call a balanced model. Southern expects us to be excellent teachers and to be competent researchers. Many, many universities, especially the ones that are really notable, like a Michigan State or a place like that, their expectations are that you'll just be a research dog, that you'll crank out two true ways a year and, and you'll stay in your office 26 hours a day, door closed, we'll slide pancakes and flounder under the door, uh, no interaction with any other people, no, never in the classroom. You've got grad students and, and loser morons in the classroom like that people who couldn't find their butts with both hands and a flashlight. But here, the expectation is that we're all teacher scholars, that we strive for excellence in teaching and that, and that we demonstrate that we're competent in scholarship. There's not an imbalance. So this thing about fit, when I joined this university, I came here because of what I perceived to be quality of life and because I fit in terms of the model, the expectations of the faculty. I would not be happy in an all-teaching school. I would not be happy in, a, in an R1 school where they have these ridiculous expectations for scholarship. By the way, dear friend of mine, graduate of Michigan State, while he was there, he saw this incredible churn among the faculty, and he asked one of his senior faculty, one of his professors, probably dissertation chair, he said, nobody gets tenure here. And the faculty member said, of the last 22 people who've gone up for tenure, we denied 21. So they set you up to fail, and I don't think that's a healthy environment. I don't think I would fit there. I don't have to answer the question for you, but you must. Where do you think you would fit? I really want you to be sensitive to that, because when you start interviewing, you need to understand that that's bilateral. They're looking at you, and you are looking at them. And you're thinking, do I want to work with and for that person? Do I want to be part of this culture? Are we resource poor? I, am I going to be joining a den of thieves where people lie, cheat, steal, 
you know, stab you in the front, stab you in the back, whatever the case may be. I want you to think hard. I know that most of you, it's premature, the notion of leaving college and, and joining an organization, but please do not, uh, do not push aside this concept of fit, it's big stuff. Now, new switch, a new topic rather. Um, well, I shouldn't say new topic, we're talking about structure. So let me talk about the organization chart. I'm on 299 and organization charts, in a legitimate sense, they are matrices. There are columns and there are rows. And the columns, whatever they may be, describe reporting relationships. If you hire me, as a team leader. I'm going to be embedded with a team. I'm going to be making decisions in real time, working with them, but I'm not really in a managerial role. If you hire me as a frontline manager, I'm going to be managing teams, several of them. So I'm going to be reporting to middle managers and middle managers report to senior managers. So if you talk about the vertical relationships of organizational chart, no matter whose they are, you're talking about reporting relationships. To whom do I report? Here, I'm a member of the management department. I report to the chair. The chair reports to the dean. The dean reports to the provost, who's the chief academic officer for the university. The provost to the president, and the president to the board of regents. So, vertical relationships in organizational charts describe reporting. Horizontal relationships describe specialization. What is it that this unit does? For example, let's, let's take a car dealership. You and I have an obligation to uh, develop an organizational chart for a car dealership. In the front end of the dealership where there are sales, there are gonna be at least three units. There will be new car sales, finance and insurance, and there will probably be another unit. It could be for, for uh, uh, fleet sales, it could be for used cars, it could be who knows what but there are often gonna be three, new cars, used cars, or fleet, and finance and insurance. So those are three units. And they're all areas of specialization. If you look at the service department, typically it's gonna have a parts function and a service function where repairs are performed and a body shop. And then if you look at the back end of the dealership, the non-revenue generated, you're gonna have an accounting department and an HR department and a marketing department. So. Um, most automobile dealerships would have about nine or ten distinctly different functional areas. And inside all of those areas, there is specialization. Agreed. So, in an organizational chart, the vertical relationships describe reporting. The horizontal relationships describe some specialization inside the firm. And, and of course, there are common elements like span of control, how many people do you think you can competently manage? Um, the notion about authority and accountability, big, big stuff. Now, I want to talk briefly about delegation. I'm on 302. I'm glad that they raised this issue. This is more a topic that, that we, we explore in the domain of leadership because competent leaders, senior leaders, delegate stuff to their junior leaders because they want it to be developed. So, if you're in any kind of a managerial role in an organization, what would your decision rules be for delegating a task? Well, some of it, some of it would be time compression. I have too many things to do. I think you're competent and trustworthy, so I'm going to delegate this task to you. Now, in my case, because I understand leadership, I'm going to tell you what needs to be done, and I expect you to decide how best to do it. If I hover over you, I'm a micromanager and that is evil. But my point is, we talk about decision rules. Under what circumstances would I delegate? Well, time compression is one of them. The second, criticality of task. If something is critical to what we're doing, I'm not gonna delegate to somebody who's been here for seven days, would you agree? I'm gonna delegate it to somebody who's demonstrated experientially that they're competent to take on that task. So oftentimes the criticality of the task will drive my decision about delegation. To whom would I delegate this? Because this person, whoever she or he is, 
as to have demonstrated some competence. The third thing, and, and this is critical, and this is why delegation is usually discussed meaningfully in, in leadership, and that is delegation of any task should be developmental. If I'm your boss, manager, whatever the title is, and, and I see you promising, I think it's my responsibility to develop you give you opportunities to grow, to get more skills, get more experiences. And I am perfectly content if you fail, as long as you do the right, the wrong things for the right reasons. Um, so my point is that, that one decision rule for, for delegation is, should this opportunity, should this task be developmental for the person to whom I'm delegating it? Um, there are other things too that, that, that sometimes weave their way into this. Confidentiality is one. Um, it pleases me that I've been in many situations where people trust me. They share things with me that they would not want public. Uh, for example, uh, I, I regularly go to a range in Pembroke that is shared with Daniel Defense. And the engineers there who are doing product development know that if, if they share something with me, a new rifle, a new chassis, a, a new anything, that I'm not gonna take pictures surreptitiously and put up on Instagram later that day. They know if they confide in me that it will be taken in confidence. So the point is, do you have the sort of relationship that, that would uh, make people trust you, that they would confide in you, with the expectation that it wouldn't leave you? You're not gonna talk about it over beers later today or send emails and say, you know what Norton told me? Um, bad, bad sort of an outcome. So again, those are just, that's a short set. Um, the time compression, the criticality, and to some degree, both of those sort of, sort of build off of competence and experience. Uh, should it be developmental? Um, is there any confidentiality in this, in this test? Uh, so now I'm on 304, and the, um, the authors talk about four types of, of uh, four types of structures, four types of designs of organization. I'm not going to run through this quickly because I'm just reaffirming what you have read, I'm sure. The first type of organizational design is a simple structure. A simple structure simply says that that Management and ownership fest in the same persons. If I started uh, an upscale casual restaurant here in town, if I owned it and managed it, then it would be a simple structure. I, I'm, I'm an owner or co-owner and, and I'm there as an active manager. Um, Frank Rozier, when he owned Rozier Ford, Frank was third generation uh, that owned that, that dealership and I think Oh gosh, about 60 years thereabouts. Frank's grandfather started it, Frank's dad ran it for a number of years, and then Frank inherited and ran it. He was an active manager. He owned and managed Rocher Ford. Uh, when Frank decided that he wanted to retire, he, he sold it to, uh, to the J.C. Lewis family, and they now have um, four car dealerships and a lot of other businesses. So the Lewises are there occasionally, but they're not daily managers. That is not a simple structure because you don't have the same people who own it managing it. So many, many firms are simple structures. Doctors' offices, uh, a lot of car dealerships, a lot of, uh, a lot of businesses in food service. Management and ownership vest in the same person. The next type of structure that's very common, and I actually talked about it a few minutes ago, would be a functional structure. You organize your business around functional areas. A functional area is a subunit where the people in that group do essentially the same thing, and they have essentially the same training. The reason that I say I mentioned it a moment ago, I was talking about car dealerships. Think about, they all have eight or 10 functional areas. They have a body shop and a service department, a parts department, sales and accounting and HR. Inside those functional areas, the people who work in them are similarly trained or educated, and they do essentially the same stuff. Um, and so, and that also describes very, very big companies. I just described Caterpillar. Uh, Caterpillar has plants all over the world and they make excavating equipment primarily. But Caterpillar has a functional structure. 
It organizes itself around the functional areas of the business, production, engineering, marketing, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes relatively small and sometimes enormous companies uh, use the functional structure. Uh, the divisional structure is the next type. And, and the divisional structure, although this is imperfect, the divisional structure is, essentially says that any division in this organization could stand alone as a separate company. Um, General Motors has a divisional structure. The only thing General Motors does now that's consequential, it's done plenty of other stuff in the past, but the only thing that GM does now is GM has four divisions that manufacture cars and light trucks. It has Chevrolet, Cadillac, Buick, and GMC. So each of those, in fact, General Motors literally was an amalgamation. A man named Albert Sloan bought a whole bunch of companies and formed General Motors probably, I guess about 100 years ago. But my point is that in a divisional structure, generally speaking, a division could be a standalone company. So divisional structures tend to align around products or geographies or customers. I understand that Boeing, the manufacturer of aircraft, and, and to a lesser degree, a defense contractor. Boeing has a divisional structure that only has two, it has two divisions. It has commercial aviation and defense contracting. So they make jets and stuff like that, and they make commercial airliners. So Boeing has two divisions which are customer oriented, commercial aviation, military contracting. Um, I describe General Motors as a product-based divisional structure for distinctly different divisions. And, and some are some companies organize themselves geographically. Um, perhaps the quickest example I can think of is Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss has, uh, um, they have Levi Strauss North America, Europe, South America, Asia. So Levi Strauss has these big geographic divisions that span the world because Japanese people like blue jeans just as much as we do. Uh, and that's true again all over the world. So Levi Strauss is, I think, a good example of a company that organizes itself around geography. It creates divisions based on regions of the world. So, and then the last, the last type of design, there, there were four, is the Matrix. And, and I cannot do this without, what's that guy's name? Can I read? Do y'all remember those Matrix movies? The slow-mo stuff where the, the bullets would pass over him. They were so bad. They were terrible. I like the John Wick movie. The Matrix movies were so lame. No, no Matrix movies. All right, I hate answering my own questions. I hate talking to 60 empty chairs. What's a Matrix? Is a Matrix a rectangular array? Is a Matrix an array of columns and rows? It sure as heck is. A spreadsheet is a Matrix. So, a Matrix form of structure says that all of us are going to be in a column. I belong in the management department in the Parker College. That is my, my, my home base, my reporting structure. But I'm also, I'm also in a whole bunch of rows. I'm on the University Athletic Committee. I'm on the College uh, Committee for Department and Tenure. Um, I'm, I'm on a number of things in the community. I'm, I'm a board member for the uh, Statesboro Police Officers Foundation. I'm active in the chamber. So Bill Norton is in one column but he's in multiple rows. And, and I could expand the rows by talking about the different classes that I teach, the different research projects that I'm on. So I'm in quite a few rows, and you will be too. Most organizations are matrical. Uh, you belong somewhere, that's your column, that is your home base, but you're gonna be assigned to all sorts of other tasks. Product development, problem resolution, community outreach, uh, so a matrix organization just says that it recognizes that you're in a column, but you're also in a whole bunch of rows. So the four design types, simple structure where ownership and management vest in the same persons. A functional structure is an organization that, that structures itself around the functional areas of a business. A divisional structure, presumably any division could stand alone as a separate business, and they tend to be aligned three ways, product, geography, or customer. And a matrix structure just says that you're in at least one column, but a whole bunch of rows. And that describes almost every organization. Almost all organizations are matrix.
PLR. So now, I know this is heartbreaking, but uh, I'm wrapping up session 11, and I need to ask the um, attendance, verification, attendance verification question. How did that salesman several years ago describe that super duty Ford to my friend Harris? Love you. Talk to you all soon.